Hey there, you're listening to Tales from the Ridge, and it would mean the world to me if after you're done with this episode, you subscribe to the show on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on and give us a rating. If you really love the show, you can head on over to Patreon and support us, and that way we can make more episodes per month, and you can get all the access to my ongoing manuscripts, short stories, all that kind of stuff, as well as the bonus podcast Kyle and I do called Bookies, where I read a book that's been made into a movie, and then we watch the movie together, and then we kind of do a quick talk and review of it. And that happens every month and is a bonus just for my patrons. But as always, thank you for listening. Second season, episode two, The Red Ghost, part two. Rod stepped out onto the porch as the odd group of riders and hover bikes pulled onto the farmstead. Even in the dim violet light of the moon, Bonnie could see that the color had yet to return to his cheeks. He was still as gray and ghostly as when they had left him. The one remaining dog barked loudly until one of the McCreary twins moved to him fearlessly and introduced himself. Bonnie watched as the dog's tongue lolled happily out of its mouth, tail wagging. Fritz tied off his horse and jogged to the porch, pulling Rod aside and speaking to him in hushed tones. Show us where it happened, Cash said as she swung off her hoss and approached Bonnie. Bonnie nodded, a knot of anxiety twisting in her guts. She had yet to see the scene herself, and the thought of it brought bile up into her throat. As the group rounded the edge of the house, Bonnie's feet refused to move forward. Got her right there, she said roughly, pointing to the laundry line. Her and one of the dogs. Take a look, Barker, said Cash with casual authority. The twin nodded and slowly made his way to the area Bonnie had indicated. He crouched his hands hovering over the scuffed dirt and torn, dried-out scrub, flashlight slowly swinging over the ground. As he worked, Bonnie turned, looking up at the small, rocky hill that protruded behind the house. At its base was a fresh pile of rocks and a small wooden marker that had yet to be named. With a slow breath, Bonnie pushed herself toward the grave, She stood over it, letting the sounds of hushed conversation and the evening breeze die away in the back of her mind. Hi, Trix, she said softly. These people are going to help me find the thing that did this to you. Bonnie, Fritz's voice called to her from the house. Bonnie turned. Her husband was leaning out the back door. Can we talk, please? As Bonnie approached the house, Fritz pulled her inside by the elbow. I want you to stay here, he said firmly. When we go out hunting, I want you to stay here at the house. No, Bonnie hissed back, her emotions surprising her. No way in hell, Fritz. 
I promised Trixie that I'm going to kill that thing, and I damn well keep my promises. Bon. It ain't up to you, Bonnie barked back. You're my husband, not my keeper. I was a coward then, and I ain't... Her voice weakened for a moment. I ain't going to be one now. Fritz looked at her with understanding. A deep sigh left him, and his shoulders slumped down a few inches. All right. All right. Which one of you saw the body? Asked Boone McCreary, bluntly. Fritz cast Bonnie a glance, and then moved out into the backyard. I did. Tell me about the wounds, as much as you can remember, anyway, said Boone, gesturing for Fritz to join him. It was unnatural, Fritz said after a shaky breath. She wasn't... Eaten, he added, nervously. More like she was mauled. Bonnie lost the thread of his words as a soft sound approached from behind her. She turned and saw Rod standing in the kitchen, his shirt untucked, hair askew, face still pale with shock. Can I get you something? Bonnie asked quietly, approaching him like a wounded animal. No, no, I was just curious what was happening, Rod said. We found some bounty hunters that'll help us track down the ghost, Bonnie answered. I want to come with, said Rod some color returning to his dark brown cheeks as he took a sudden step forward. I want to hunt that thing down. I know, said Bonnie with a nod. I won't stop you, but Fritz might try. I have every right to kill. Bonnie broke off Rod's anger by wrapping her arms around him and squeezing tightly. The man slackened slightly in the embrace, his head slowly burying into her shoulder as he began to weep. I know, was all she said. We've got a trail. Fritz burst through the back door and paused at the scene he found. We, um, the twins think they know where it went off to. Bonnie pushed Rod back into standing holding his shoulders in her hands. You ready? Give me a minute, said the widower as he quickly moved off toward his bedroom. I don't think bringing Rod is a good... I don't want to hear it, Fritz, said Bonnie, shooting him a look that held the heat of a thousand suns. Fritz sighed and moved back outside. Bonnie, too, went to her own bedroom quickly pulling slacks and one of her husband's flannel shirts from the dresser. She stripped quickly, throwing on the clothes much more suited to riding and hunting. With a grunt, she sank down onto the hard mattress and pulled on her boots. As Bonnie stood once more, she glanced aside at the dusty mirror that gazed at her from the corner of the room locking eyes with her own unfamiliar reflection. She straightened her back and then strode from the room, nearly bumping into Rod as she did so. The two of them said nothing, stepping out into the nighttime air together. We're lending them horses, said Fritz as soon as her feet touched the dirt outside. They don't want the hover bikes to scare the thing off. Horses are quieter. We don't have enough tack for everyone, Bonnie pointed out. The twins claim to be able to ride bareback, said Fritz quietly. Ain't a claim, it's the truth, said Barker with a smirk. And tack will walk, Fritz said with an anxious glance at the jauntar who was idly gazing over the cows in the corral. All right then 
said Bonnie with a deep sigh. Cash took Trixie's horse, a yellow palomino named Hayes, and June swung up onto a young gelding they had just purchased that year. Barker and Boone sat astride two of the older horses that did not see much use these days except to keep the cows company. The twins led the way, following the trail of tracks and markings they had found while Bonnie had been inside the house. Over the sound of crickets and other nighttime bugs, Tack's large, clawed feet beat an odd rhythm as she jogged beside the horses, going little more than a trot. Fast enough to make progress, but slow enough that the twins could keep navigating by signs invisible to everyone else without their training. The pace, though understandable, was agonizing to Bonnie, who could feel her grief percolating into anger with every moment. She kept her gaze forward, watching the silhouettes of red rocks backed by a cascade of galaxy that moved imperceptibly over the landscape. Bonnie looked over her shoulder as Cash Guthrie urged Hayes up beside Matilda, the two horses shaking their heads hello. Tell me more about this red ghost, said the gunslinger, her gaze fixed towards the horizon. What have you heard? Bonnie asked. Not much, Cash admitted. We haven't been on Messier 1 for a while, and from what I understand, this has only been going on for a few months. Bonnie nodded. It started with losing cattle out on the range, she began. We weren't the only ones hit. More than a few folks were alarmed. Some even lost a few ranch hands. And no one's done anything yet? Cash asked with a quick glance at Bonnie. Some folks didn't seem to believe it was all the work of one um, creature. Bonnie struggled to explain. Ain't nobody ever seen it, you see. Cash nodded. Rod had been worried that it had started following our herds, stalking the men home, watching the farm. I guess... Bonnie cleared her throat and blinked rapidly. I guess he was right. And during the attack, Cash's voice was gentle. You didn't hear anything? Didn't see anything? Just saw shadows, Bonnie said softly. Just heard the dogs. Why are folks calling it the Red Ghost? Cash asked. A few times when folks have caught a glimpse, all they see is a vague red shape and some fur has been left behind. Yes, Cash answered. Fritz showed us the tuft that he found. The two women rode in silence for a long moment. It was a peaceful silence, full of rumination. Bonnie got the impression that Cash was someone who was not put off by quiet, that both of them could sit here for hours comfortably, riding horses across dark red dirt and not say a word. I'm sorry to make you relive it, Cash finally admitted, looking down at where her hands held the reins. I'll be reliving it every day of my damn life, I think, Bonnie said with a mirthless laugh. Cash had no reply to that, just a tiny nod of her head that seemed to carry the weight of the acknowledgement Bonnie needed. Barker and Boone slowed their horses, and everyone else followed suit. Cash slowly pushed Hayes toward the front of the group. The Palomino tossed her white mane with a huff. Bonnie felt Matilda's anxiety beneath her, the horse's hooves shuffling, her ears flipping back and down slightly. 
we're close, said one of the twins, though Bonnie did not need the words to know it was the truth. The group had made their way to the opening of an odd canyon that snaked its way across the next mile or so. Striated red rock wormed in irregular curves before them. Bonnie knew that her best friend's killer lay at the end of that maze. I advise we stay in pairs, said Boone, so if it jumps us, we aren't alone, but it won't get the whole group either. A few heads nodded in agreement. Cash moved to her sister's side and Fritz to Rod's. Tack strode to stand beside Matilda and shook her large scaled head at Bonnie. The air was still inside the belly of the rock formation. The breeze above them whispered oddly, sending down a thin rain of red dust every once in a while. With the large lizard woman beside her, Bonnie felt little fear. Between her anger and Tack's four arms, she doubted the red ghost's odds. A haunting sound Bonnie first mistook as the wind began to moan through the canyon. Tack put one comforting clawed hand on Matilda's saddle as the horse huffed in displeasure. Worry not, good horse, said the jontar. I protect. Bonnie found herself smiling genuinely for the first time that night. The smile quickly vanished as another lonely howl washed over the group. The deeper they went into the cave, the more the palpable unease rose among the group, and the more piles of bones and other discarded things began to appear. They passed a recent kill, a coyote that had met a grisly, untimely demise. Bonnie turned her gaze away, just in time to see Barker raise one fist in the air for a halt. The horses were so agitated, Bonnie would not have been surprised had they suddenly bolted. A twisted cave sprung from an outcropping of stone, carved long ago by a long dead river. The moaning came from within the shadows of its mouth. Spread out, hissed Boone, and each rider moved into a line facing the cave. They waited in tense silence. Then, from within the cave, the moaning stopped replaced by a slow, dragging sound. It was then that Bonnie noticed the smell, a sickly, sweet, rotting smell that filled the air like a noxious gas. She heard Fritz gag. A large, red, unruly paw stepped from the shadows, followed by another. She heard Boone curse under his breath as the thing showed its face lit up by the lavender moonlight. Bonnie could not say what stood before them, but she didn't have to. It's a goddamn chimera! Boone hollered as the creature lowered its cat-shaped head. A dazzling red light went off as Cash fired a flare. The charge skittered around, littering them all in its chaotic glow. The chimera's lizard-like body moved with unnatural speed over the red earth as it leapt towards the twins. Barker managed to get off a shot before it caught him from the saddle and slammed him into the ground. With a roar, Tack bound forward, lifting the beast from the McCreary boy and throwing it against the canyon wall. The chimera was stunned as its body slithered down the rock it landed on its wide, clawed paws with ease, shaking its grisly, maned head, matted fur swinging wildly. Its barbed tail slashed out at the Jontar woman, who leapt back in fear and surprise. Watch out for that tail, warned Boone as he climbed back up in the saddle 
It's poisonous. Move, Tack. Cash commanded calmly as she flanked the animal with her horse. Tack obliged, backing up until she was again in the line of horses. The chimera's slitted eyes darted around the space, unable to fix upon a single one of its attackers for any longer than a second. That hide is resistant to bullets, Barker said as the chimera lunged at his horse. Even bareback, the twin maneuvered his steed quickly out of the way. We might... The man was taken by surprise as the chimera stung its tail where his head had been only a moment before. The beast did not wait another moment, scrambling up the side of the rock and throwing itself at Cash. Cash and her horse both fell to the side, the steed screaming in fear. Cash! June screeched as her own horse rebelled, galloping away further down the canyon. Don't shoot! yelled Boone as Fritz raised his shock rifle. You might hit her! Cash's horse managed to right itself, its saddle empty as it followed June's, bolting away. Cash lay beneath the chimera, which gnawed unknowingly on the end of her shock pistol. With a loud crack, the beast stumbled back, its jaw now hanging oddly to one side. An ungodly howl left its maw as green blood splashed over Cash's face. Bonnie pushed Matilda forward, and the horse reared up as they reached the animal, bringing her front hooves down upon its back. The chimera shrieked, and Cash took the opportunity to scramble upward. As Bonnie and Matilda circled back, a lasso looped over the chimera's neck and tightened. Bonnie followed the rope with her eyes back to Fritz, who nodded at her. Rod had his own lasso out as well and leapt down from the saddle, swinging it in a wide O above his head. The beast wriggled against the rope and nearly pulled Fritz down off his horse until Tack lent a hand or four. With its head pinned to the canyon floor, the chimera's lizard body wriggled like a fish out of water. Rod let his lasso fly, and it snagged around the beast's legs, tying them taut. The chimera was growling now, whining a low keen that made Bonnie almost pity it. Where did this thing come from? she asked. A lab, said Barker, wiping the sweat from his brow with a bandana. Intercoastal bred these to use as scouting mounts during the gold rush. You can't be serious, said Rod, gazing down at the beast, gnashing its teeth at all of them. Messier One was a more wild place back then, said Boone affirmatively. They eventually phased them out, the man said with dramatic finger quotes. But clearly, a few must have escaped. I can't imagine trying to ride one of these, said Bonnie, watching the slitted eyes of the chimera dance around the canyon in agitation, green blood pooling beneath its head from the wound in its jaw. This one's feral, said Barker. They weren't so bad when they were taken care of, bonded with their riders, actually. How do you know all of this? Fritz asked of the twins, dubiously. We might have, uh, been <clears throat> a part of that scouting core, said Barker, clearing his throat. Bonnie felt an ember of pity light up in her heart. It took everything she had to not instantly snuff it out. There was the sound of horses' hooves against hard dirt as June reappeared, leading her steed on foot, taking in the scene with wide eyes. "'What do with Creature?' asked Tack carefully. "'This one's too far gone,' said Boone with a deep sigh. 
Otherwise, I would have asked Cash nicely if we could keep it. Barker nodded solemnly while Cash scoffed. There was a long silence where no one said a thing, each standing still, gazing at the trapped chimera that wriggled between them all, the flare finally pittering out in a puff of smoke. I'll do it, Bonnie said quietly. Every head turned to look at her. There's a soft spot in the skull just behind the eye, Boone said mournfully. Your rifle ain't going to pierce those scales. Bonnie looked at Rod, who nodded at her with purpose. With a slight shake in her hands, Bonnie approached the chimera as Fritz and Rod hogtied its limbs to its body. Tack held the rope around its neck, keeping the head pinned and still against the earth. Bonnie sat quietly beside the beast and held its gaze. The chimera's bright yellow eye seemed to focus for the first time, holding her in an eerie stare. I understand now, Bonnie said to it softly. You weren't meant to be here, not like this. She petted the beast's mangy mane. Cash handed Bonnie her own pistol and she gladly took the more maneuverable gun, holding it to the spot that Boone had indicated. I'm going to help you go now. I'm sorry. I imagine you've been quite lonely. Bonnie would hold what happened next as a secret until her dying day. A deep, soft vibration came up from the beast's throat, meeting her hand where it lay against its neck. Chimera purred at her, closing its eyes as she pulled back the action on Cash's gun. After a loud pop and a bright blue burst of light, the purring stopped. Come look at this, said Barker as Bonnie stood. She moved to the entrance of the Chimera's cave. Barker swung a small neon lantern into the dark. Inside was a skeleton, sitting upright against the cave wall, one bleached white arm folded over its lap. Fragments of clothing still clung to the bones. The remains of a campfire long ago extinguished rested beside it, a series of soot stains arching up the canyon stone behind it. Barker pulled a pack from a dark corner of the cave and held it up to the light. The Intercoastal Mining and Rail Company logo reflected back at him from a patch on the flap, a name embroidered just above it. Well, I'll be, said the twin breathlessly. That's where old Georgie went. Georgie? June asked poking her head into the cave. Who's that? He was a scout, said Boone. Just like us. Must have heard the plans for the Chimera Corps and run off. More than a few folk did. It weren't just the beasts who had bonded, added Barker, his voice distant and sad. What should we do with them? asked June her eyes locked to the skeleton. Move that chimera in here and leave them together, just like they ought to have been, Barker replied, striding from the cave to do just that. Barker and Boone undid the ropes around the chimera with ceremonial movements. With Tack's help, the beast was quickly moved into the cave to rest beside its skeletal rider. It was a contemplative silence that fell over the group as they mounted up once more. As the horses moved out of the canyon, the cool breeze of morning greeted them just as the first hints of daylight began to rise over the horizon. I think Trix will rest easy, said Rod as he walked his horse beside Bonnie. Well, 
I hope if she doesn't, she haunts you and not me, said Bonnie, sending a small smile his way. The two friends shared a long gaze that held a storm's worth of emotion. Let's get home, said Bonnie quietly, and Rod bobbed his head in agreement. The horses and their riders sped up over the crimson dirt, the sunrise casting their shadows back toward the canyon in long strands. Bonnie glanced back over her shoulder for a split second, half expecting to see the chimera gazing back from the warped shadows. Just another ghost haunting the dirt hills, like so many before it, and so many to come. Matthew, Taysom, Vicky, Michael, Willow, Jill, Orsoya, Frenchon, Fritz, Rodney, Andrew, Megan, Kira, Camille, Emily, Andy, and Kat. And as always, thanks for listening. I mean, anytime I get to shout, it's a goddamn! <laughs> Sometimes I write these things down and I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? Because I know exactly what you're going to do. Yeah, goddamn Camaro! <laughs> I mean, I don't want you to not say it that way. But. but not that way. Right, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs>